I can quickly open it. Oh no. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the solution of last week's Sherlock Holmes video. I actually have only received one answer so that was quite disappointing but I'm going to show you the correct answer anyways and maybe it will be helpful to you someday. I think it was still a worthwhile exercise and I hope you tried it out because this is the only way how we actually, you know, sometimes we'll have a little bit fun here. Okay, so I think I mentioned a few clues last time and the first clue was the clinical information that it's really important. And what you get from this information here, first of all, is the proximal or the humerus fracture and the radialis injury or the radial nerve injury. Now with this combination we already can suspect that there was some high radial nerve injury meaning the radial nerve was injured above the level of the elbow and um, because it has this quite uh, you know the course of the nerve here runs in close proximity to the bone. Now if you sustain a proximal humerus fracture or a humerus shaft fracture here in a complex trauma case you might get occasionally injuries to the radial nerve. Now what does a radial nerve injury actually mean at this level? Now since it does innervate different muscles a few are listed here then this kind of damage can result in a wrist drop so you do not really have the you know the uh, ability to extend your wrist and especially also the fingers anymore. Um, so it says here radial nerve palsy results in debilitating motor dysfunction of the hand. The patient loses the ability to extend the wrist, fingers and the thumb. So these are the three things we need to remember. Wrist, fingers and thumb. Movements that are essential for a functional grasp. Now the sensibility is not so much of an issue and seems to be well tolerated. This is from an article here and you find the link in the description down below. Uh, it's a very good article with a good few uh, images as well, which we will see later here. Now a high radial nerve palsy is defined as an injury above the elbow and this occurs or the following symptoms occur. You have wrist, finger and thumb extension that are lost. And now with tendon transfer procedures, you mainly want uh, the following re-established. You want to re-establish or restore the finger extension at the level of the MCP joints, restoration of the thumb extension and uh, of the wrist extension as well. So this is kind of like what we can get out of from the clinical information. Since the patient had a tendon transfer, a radial nerve injury and a humerus fracture, we know that the tendon transfer was done for the radial nerve injury, meaning they did some tendon transfers at the level of the wrist to restore the extension and of the wrist and the fingers and the thumb and this is now what we will have to assess. So let's have a look at the images here and I mentioned to you that susceptibility artifacts are your friend and this is kind of like cue number two or clue number two rather. So what we want to open up is a T2 3D sequence where we can see some susceptibility artifacts just like here. And you can see here, based on these susceptibility artifacts, this is now on the Walder side of the wrist, we can see they probably did something here at this level. Okay, so this is typically where they put the sutures in, like this. Oh, sorry. So like this. They, this is the result from the suture that they had to close again here. So they wanted some access here to this region, and we will come back to that later. Where else do we see susceptibility artifacts? We can see here there are some susceptibility artifacts along the radial side of the wrist. And if we move dorsally, we can also see here some susceptibility artifacts on the dorsal side of the wrist. So we have kind of like susceptibility artifacts everywhere, but we will come back to that later. So if you are now opening up any of the transverse sections and you are scrolling through, you should do, or the first thing you should do is check for the, you know, for the tendons, right? Tendon transfer, I mean. And so we can start off maybe here and with the first extensor compartment. And here already we see what's this. So we have the two tendons in the first extensor compartment, which seem to run normally. And we have an additional tendon here. This is not normal. So 
And since we had some susceptibility artifacts also on the radial side, we know that this is one of the transferred tendons. Then we go to the second compartment here, which, you know, looks fine. This is Lister's tubercle. We are now trying to find the EPL, or the third extensor compartment tendon. And we don't see any tendon that's crossing over here. So the EPL, extensor pollicis longus, is missing. Okay, we note that. And then we have the fourth extensor compartment here, which looks okay. There is this black structure going down here, which I'm not quite sure what that is, but uh, for the exercise here, um, I think we just ignore it. So um, with this one here, there's one thing I'd like to mention if we go back to the T2 3D. We go to the dorsal side, this is the fourth extensor compartment, we have the extensor digitorum communis, and you kind of like see here at this level, at this very most proximal level, how there, it's not going straight down, it has a kind of like a movement in the radial direction here for some reason. So I found this a little bit suspicious. Now I also mentioned that NPR is a very good clue. Now if you do an NPR here, and you just focus on the transverse here. We start distally, we go proximally, and we focus on the fourth extensor compartment here. We can see how at this proximal level it runs over to the radial side. This is not where it's supposed to go, at least not to that obviously, okay? So we note that as well. Now going back here to the axial here, we can also have a look here. Fourth extensor compartment looks fine. Fifth and sixth ECU tendon looks fine. Some magic angle artifacts here. Now moving to the flexor tendons, we can start off with the FCU tendon here, which seems to be normal at the level of the pisiform. Proximally seems to be in order. The flexor tendons here in the carpal tunnel, they kind of look unremarkable as well. Then we have the flexor carpi radialis tendon here next to the trapezial ridge. And if you follow that one proximally, it kind of like shows this very strange signal change, which it normally doesn't. So normally it goes quite straight, similar like the other flexor tendon. So any signal change here is weird and we kind of lose it here. And this is just where we have the susceptibility artifacts. Now, because this uh, T2 sequence is quite susceptible to a kind of like different orientations of the fibers. We can have a look at the PD transverse here. So this is again the, let me just zoom in here a little bit, the flexor carpi radialis tendon going proximally. It's thinning out and here we kind of lose it. So normally we should have a quite a big tendon here. Now let's note this too. And that's basically all for the tendons, right? So, so one tendon I forgot to show you and this is obviously not always present, but we don't have any clear palmaris longus tendon here anywhere. So this is maybe just another thing to note. So to summarize, we have susceptibility artifacts all around. And first of all, there is the EPL missing on its original spot. We have a new tendon on the radial side and the extensor digitorum communis is proximally deviated to the radial side and the FCR tendon shows a defect with some stump which is kind of curled up a little bit and proximally not visible. Now based on this here we know certainly this new tendon is a transfer but what about the others? Now this is something you cannot really know but now when you know radial nerve injury and tendon transfer what you can do is you just google it. So what you do is you go to google and you type in the problem right? You're just having radial nerve injury, tendon transfer, and you are looking for any like articles that catch your eye. And I think here, this one is pretty good. So you can see I clicked this one already. And I have the link to this one in the description down below. And here you can find a few interesting illustrations and also arguments when to do which transfer and stuff. So this is a different technique and they also go into some older techniques 
but this was not the case in, in our uh, patient but this one here actually so we missed the EPL as I have shown you and we have an additional tendon on the more radial side so they took the palmaris longus tendon connected it to the EPL to restore thumb extension here so let me just quickly show you this here so basically the extensor pollicis longus which is not here anymore runs now down here right and it's then connected with the uh, palmaris longus down here so maybe we have to use the ampere function here again make this one big And so this is distally the thumb. This is our additional tendon here, this one. And as we follow it proximally, you can see how it goes into the more bolder aspect here, right? There. So this is the palmaris longest tendon connected with the EPL tendon. So these two here basically reflect to the PL to the EPL. Now as the, the other one here, extensor digitorum communis deviated to the radial side and the flexor corpus radialis is defect with a stump distally is actually a second tendon transfer FTR to extensor digitorum communis to restore also the function of the finger extension. And we can basically, uh, well not here, but on the Google and the article here, you can see here flexor carpi radialis to extensor digitorum communis. Now the angle here, we can't really appreciate this on the MR properly, but we see the defect of the FCR at the distal portion because they cut it through on the waller side, transferred it over and connected it here with the extensor digitorum communis. Right. So to summarize the case, patient had a radial nerve injury above the elbow, so a high radial nerve injury with wrist drop and they needed to do a tendon transfer to restore the function. For that they used the EPL tendon, the third extensor tendon, and connected it with the palmaris longus. So palmaris, oh, palmaris longus to EPL which is this additional tendon here to restore thumb motion. Then they used the FCR tendon here, switched it around and connected it with the extensor digitorum communis. That's the second tendon transfer. Now, when I read the article, there was the mentioning that they typically do some more, one more tendon transfer more proximally, but that's not imaged here. And obviously we did not comment on that. So I hope you found this case interesting and as a summary here just one image. So here this last article uh, from 2011 tendon transfer for radial uh, nerve injuries current surgical techniques. I can quickly open it. Oh no. Okay let's try that one more time. Okay there you are. So, good article as well. You can see uh, wrist drop and here tendon transfer for radial nerve palsy, wrist extension, not with the FCU, but we had the FCR transfer. So, uh, PL to EPL for the thumb, flexor carpi radialis to extensor digitorum communis, and pronator teres to ECRB, which they seem to do for the wrist extension, which is not imaged on our sequences. Thanks for watching, and hopefully, I'll see you next time. So before you move on to the next video, I want you to briefly reflect on how much benefit you get out of my videos here. How much of the stuff that I'm teaching you can you actually apply in clinical routine? If you get something out of it, then you could consider to become a patron of my YouTube channel. Patreon is an online platform where people can support other content creators just like me. You can find the link over here and click there right now. Now, there are other options as well. If you really want to go to your next level in MSK, then you can consider to join the Virtual MSK Radiology Fellowship. You find the link down here and also in the description of this video. 
The Virtual MSK Fellowship is a one-on-one -on -one case based teaching program where I help radiologists to get to their next level by increasing their speed and especially confidence in MSK reporting. So go check that one out.